Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the importance of financial literacy and education for all with special guests. Matt Morrison, President and CEO of the Council for Economic Education, which supports youth in learning personal finance. Josh Lax, CEO of MoneyThink.org in Chicago, which supports college students in gaining financial literacy. And Charles Skip Bowen, Chairman of the Board and CEO of First Command Educational Foundation, which supports veterans and active military in financial readiness. Thank you all for joining us. It is just wonderful. We have not only a national perspective here, but different parts of this really complicated uh, picture of financial literacy, which is a life skill that school systems, for some reason in, in capitalist America, don't teach in any consistent and sustained way. And, and frankly, many of us adults have never had any consistent um, uh, financial education. If we, if we are not financially liter- uh, literate, it hurts us in large and small ways every day. So uh, let's start with, with how we change this issue of disparity in financial literacy. My neighbor, who is less financially literate than I am, is going to have a disadvantage in terms of their life trajectory versus mine, given the way our system works. How do we change that? And let's start with you, Nan, uh, at the Council for Economic Education. You focus on you. How do you approach teaching young folks on how to manage money? And how do you see the, the actual challenge here? So thanks uh, for having all of us. It's great to be here with everybody. So our, I want to just start with our mission because it says something. We teach K-12 to kids. We want to give them the tools, the tools and knowledge of personal finance and economics so that they can make good decisions for themselves, their families, and communities. So for us, we don't want to teach an eight-year-old about a mortgage, but we want to give them the habits, the tools, the confidence with words that have to do with money and finance so that they can build those capabilities. It's just like when you're a little kid, you don't expect to be in the Olympics when you're six years old, but you should be able to do the dog paddle when you get into the pool and not be scared. So that's what we're really trying to achieve. And we do that in a few ways. One is we make the lessons for the kids really fun and engaging. So we still read Aesop's fables, the grasshopper and the ant, but our ant has a bank account. So kids understand that. Actually, today they might have an electronic wallet instead of a bank account. Um, We we try to engage the students. So we have a wonderful program for for high school girls called Invest in Girls. It's focused on um, low and moderate income girls of color. And we start out with talking about their money personalities so that they can understand a little bit about why they might want to be making certain decisions or not. And we also have some really fun ways for students to get engaged, high school students, like our National Personal Finance Challenge. They compete at the state and, and national levels, and it just makes the learning more fun. We also invest heavily in professional development for teachers, always our core, because like many Americans, they too need the confidence and the competence to be able to deal with these issues themselves. I see Josh nodding and and also to be able to teach their kids because teachers really want to do the best job for their kids always. My mom was a teacher and I know that was her guiding guiding principle. Um, The other thing that we do that's really important is we advocate for these subjects to be taught in school, which is super important. Kids don't get this knowledge at home for a whole host of reasons. Sometimes the kids turn out to be the navigators if their parents don't speak English. Um, Sometimes parents aren't or caregivers aren't around at the right times to help their their kids. Um, And they they just might not know it themselves. And there's a 16 point gap in access to financial educations between the wealthier kids and the um, kids from low and moderate income areas. If they is live it a in a cause state, or an effect? Is it a it, cause or an effect? A cause or an effect? Well, I, I, not having a requirement causes that 16 point gap. There's no requirement to teach personal finance. There's a 16 point gap between the better off kids and the less off kids. I wonder so, whether transgenerationally, when it, uh, families are less well off, in part because of that gap. So it's a self perpetuating uh, disparity in which. Uh, families who don't necessarily have that and the kids who don't necessarily have that generation after generation, you end up with, with difference. Josh, you know, you're, you're the beneficiary of some of man's work, right? Cause you're, you're taking 
uh, kids who who are uh, you know college students, right? And and do you feel like that sort of foundation that man goes all the way back to kindergarten? Is that important in terms of helping young people when they're when they're at the age that you get them um, to prepare them for their next step? Because yeah, know, this is really more important, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, thanks, Mark, for having us on. And uh, plus one to what Nan said, we actually start a little bit earlier. Um, so we work with uh, high school seniors, even high school juniors. And our work is really focused on demystifying college costs uh, for those students, their families, and even um, college guidance counselors, because we see that financial planning and uh, the, the finances around college um, is really a huge, huge barrier, uh, particularly for traditionally marginalized students. And so we tackle this kind of college affordability uh uh, issue upstream so that all students, particularly again, you know, those who have been left of the margins really can clearly determine which schools offer them the best value and be able to choose uh, much more clearly and more confidently. And so given, given what you're, you know, kind of outlining in Nan's work, absolutely. I mean, the, the ability for students to build on their knowledge base around financial literacy and also thinking about, well, what does it mean to be financially secure and financially well? Financial literacy is great, um, and it's a great start. You know, I would I would offer that all of us want to see individuals and communities in a more financially secure state, and that that's really through long term behavioral change. And so, starting really young with students, and again, their families and uh, the folks who support them is really critical. So we've come to this point because of our trajectory since two thousand eight. And we've really iterated and tested different strategies to understand, uh, you know, what is what's working with um, young people, teenagers, um, what's really sticking with them, and and most importantly, where are their pressure points and, and pain points. And so, uh, quick snapshot, you know, we were um, providing uh, near peer mentorship for years. Uh, across the country. And even though we were founded in Chicago, we're a nationally facing organization. And so we saw that, hey, near peer mentorship can actually work. And what if we baked in cultural relevant kind of examples? Like what are celebrities and athletes? How are they managing their money? What are they thinking about investing in? Well, and so bringing in those- rural, kind of If you're in a rural area and and your, um, your work and your parents' work, your folks' work is really about uh, yields per acre, you're going to use different examples. Absolutely. That you're yeah. on an, in an inner city situation where you're talking absolutely. about exchange. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and really our approach now has been, um, you know, ramping up since, since 2008 and, and seeing again, what works and really where we can have the greatest scale for greatest impact around informing uh, and, and empowering, frankly, students in their financial decision-making. I mean, it's a really, really critical point. And so again, to build on uh, Nan's work and, and the wonderful uh, work that the council is doing, starting early is so, so critical. And then, you know, college matriculation uh, for those who are choosing to go that route is really the biggest decision that a young person will have at that point. And, and so how that's a, a, another a real big expense that needs to be managed, right? Student debt and so on. And then we have... Skip, in, in, in the military, you have one of the largest employers in the world. So you have here now a, a another take on this where we have employed individuals, right? People who are entering, serving, and exiting military service. And, and there is also the need with this incredible diversity of talent that you have and people coming from different places, you also have this, this opportunity to help people uh, provide to give them the skills to take power in this part of their lives as well. Right, Skip? Absolutely. You know, uh, I was recently talking to the superintendent of the Naval Academy, Admiral, uh, Vice Admiral Buck, and he has a program there that he's working on with the midshipmen to teach them life skills. And the reason is, is as we discussed previously, uh, before maybe people were viewing militaries across section of America, same foibles, they bring into the same same issues as everybody else in America into the military. And when you don't start teaching young people financial literacy early, you 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 create, well, look, somebody, some young kid 
anybody can be a millionaire. I tell everyone that. Let me tell you something. Uh, and I can prove that. Uh, and I can prove it because lottery tickets are huge. The huge numbers of lottery tickets bought are low income people. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the cigarette smoking in America is young people. Between those two things, we're looking at 300 a month. Somehow people come up with 300 a month for those things, yet they don't do anything with uh, saving and investing for the future. You start young, you're, it's, a mil it's a millionaire ticket right there. They've won the lottery ticket. All they've got to do is start young. Now, that doesn't mean you can't play catch up or, or should not work on it later, but it is an issue. So I tell everybody in the military, you know, all you have to do is learn these basic skills. So First Command Educational Foundation, we're a 501c3 uh, public charity, and we're dedicated to, and our focus is educating those who serve. We do that three ways. One is in-person financial literacy presentations. Another is online programs, like uh, we have a take command program, uh, really completely focused on active duty military and, and a money matters online program that's more broad, in, even in the first responder uh, community. We also uh, do scholarships. So that's my take. I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. And, and, and the interesting he thing here is that if, if we take a look at the ARC, financial education is one of those things that you have to continue to do to keep your skills sharp, right? You have to start very early, otherwise you don't have the foundational thinking, right, Nan? You don't, you can't really, you don't have a platform on which to build. Although, although I would say the fundamentals stay pretty much the same. So the new standards that came out for personal finance this year, and it was they were um, updated by a coalition of people. We partnered closely with the Jumpstart Coalition and literally dozens of experts in the field. Um, and, and we talked about six basic things, savings, investing, earning, spending. Hold, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's go through that. Savings. Savings, spend, investing. Investing. Earning. And spending. And spending. Risk and credit. And, you know, a few years ago, risk might not have included things like cybersecurity. But we have lessons for third and fourth graders that are called Goldilocks and the three passwords, right? You have to start teaching about the kids, the kids about these things when they're young. But the basic concepts, those six concepts, pretty much incorporate, can incorporate all the changes that have happened even just over the last few years. It's so, so interesting, security as, as teaching security because somebody can break into your account later on, right? And if you sensitize people from very, very early on, they develop these unconscious habits that secure their wealth, right? That's what you're basically saying. There are all these different life skills that we never even thought of as being part of financial literacy, but but somehow they've become it, right? I mean, Skip, you're, you're smiling there, right? The, but the, certainly not 30 years ago. Yeah, uh, a, a, fam a famous senior Coast Guard leader once said, well, I better not say exactly what he said. <laughs> he put a moratorium on buying laptops 30 years ago. And uh, it was uh, just interesting that he thought more than one person could use a laptop. Uh, uh, it's just because uh, the world we've evolved into is, is great. All these tools really help us. But you have to know how to use them and also how they relate to financial literacy. I agree with that. Um, we just got a call, uh, a, a question from uh, Tito Hardy, um, who said, um, how do you guide or advise individuals who live in poverty? I mean, it's a great question because, you know, if, if you're struggling on a day to day basis just to, to put together enough to eat. Right. The, the whole idea of theoretical sort of long term planning and, and financial literacy seems so distant. But in order to get out of it, you need to have those skills. Josh, do you have a do you have a, a an answer for that? How do you how do you help people break that cycle? Yeah, it's a it is a multi pronged approach, and it's uh, uh, you know unfortunately going to take generations to realize. However, you know in the immediate moment, um, we know that education is frankly the biggest factor in breaking generational and situational poverty. So. Um, and we know over the course of a lifetime, a college degree, an affordable one, uh, you know, that person's going to earn about a million dollars more um, than their high school graduate counterparts. They're going to have better uh, access to health care and jobs. They tend to stay uh, longer in a job and, and in less recidivism. So we know that there are really tangible benefits and we know that education is frankly the biggest um, lever. And it's also not easy. 
And, you know, tracking back to our conversation here, if we can provide the really easily accessible resources, the tools, and really coming at it from a strengths-based approach, right? I think a lot of times financial literacy is seen as like a deficit, right? Like one has to become financially literate. Our approach, and I think um, many folks' approaches is like, hey, you know, we know that you've got this and we want to, we got your back. Um, so let's let's give the tools and the resources to feel even more empowered and tracking back to, again, building those those knowledge bases, those those uh, understandings around finances. And, and really, like it can be really complicated and complex and numbers can mean a lot of different things. So having a way early on in a person's life to simplify that uh, concept, to understand how that maps to their real life situations and, you know, getting some, again, easily accessible and really powerful and relevant tools in place to help um, enable folks to, to, to do that. And, and it is, unfortunately, a, a long game, right? We see the huge gaps um, between different kinds of communities, uh, particularly those who are coming from low-income situations. Um, we see huge gaps from those who are first-generation college students in terms of, uh, you know, financial capability, college graduation, job and career. So um, it is a multi-pronged uh, approach. And uh, and we're also knowing because we see the data and, and it's on a very personal level as well, right? That there are certain levers that help individuals and communities break out of that cycle of poverty and it has to start young and it has to start around financial financial I capability. Think, I think part of this is that, you know, if, if, you, if you combine... Uh, financial literacy ideas with respect for situations that people are in and you take their intelligence and have them analyze their decision trees in a financial yep. light, right? You yep. can make better decisions, what food yep. you buy, and that yep. goes a longer way that, that you're, that for example, even the food that you buy has a longer shelf life, so you have less spoilage, right? Those kinds of concepts of, of, of planning combined with the intelligence and the expertise that people acquire through their daily lives, and their lived experience, that combination is very, very powerful. I mean, that's kind of a, isn't that, isn't that kind of a, a military culture, right? You, you bring what you have to the table, you add to it ingredients, that you learn from others, from, from your fellows, from your trainers and so on and so forth, and you create solutions in real time. I would, th I would think so. But again, people come from the cultures that they're in. The culture, the culture that we're in is driving everyone to debt. To de I mean, these kids in, in, in college, actually in high school, in high school, my daughter was getting credit cards in the mail and, and we found out about it later. I mean, um, it drives these these kids and if they're not ready for it, all of a sudden they're in massive debt and they say, oh, we can't do anything about it. Or they they make a life choice and maybe they're in one of those low income jobs and they, oh, I'm stuck here for whatever reason and I can't do anything about it. But the answer is very simple. It's it's putting together a budget, sticking with a budget, watching debt and and, and putting some portion away throughout your whole life. Now. I understand that some people get where there's there. I mean, there's no way it's insurmountable, but look, I was an enlisted person. Uh, I retired as an enlisted person and then I retired. I had $27,000 and I, and I realized I, I now I have a pension and things like that. Some, some, but, but I, I was able, I, I, I got into this. I was able to use these skills and really build up a, a lot of capital and other people can do that too. And that's that's about this whole thing. And the, the answer really is getting to people early, no matter what socioeconomic strata they're in. Can we talk, Mark? Mark can I jump in really quickly? Because something that you said is is really resonant, and I think it's uh, for our viewers to to understand. the The aspect of meeting people where they're at is really really huge. Like we have to be better listeners. And we have to really understand, again, where those pain and pressure points are and what kinds of resources and tools work for those folks situationally. And so we've taken that as our approach uh, organizationally, organizationally throughout our history and meeting, meeting students where they're at, understanding those pressure points, understanding, hey, does this work or does that work? What's going to help you now? But also, how do we think about the long term 
you know, game. And I, I would, you know, we, we've been really um, hell bent, frankly, on how do we create a more informed education consumer base in our, in our uh, world, right? How do we create more informed education consumers that also leads to more holistic financial wellness and security down the line. And so I, I just wanted to touch on that point because meeting people where they're at and really in an equity-based, uh, equity-centric design is so, so important. And I think the landscape has been too fragmented. And so, you know, we don't pretend to have the magic bullet, um, but we also are really staunch on, hey, we, we think we're onto something because of, of the track record that we have. And not just around college affordability, but really working with young people. And now you're going to welcome the results of this of this uh, uh, last poll. We took we asked when financial education should start, and we got kindergarten and before, and uh, you know preschool, and we got uh, elementary school, and we got middle school, and we got high school. N- nobody answered after high school in terms of when it should start. Right, this your K through twelve. Uh, range, the consensus is that 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 is the time, if possible, when you should be talking about these issues and on a sustained basis. And that's what that's what you do. That sort of sustained education is it, part of your DNA. It, well, it, yes, and we'd like it to be everywhere. But just to um, put some some footnotes around what Josh and and Skip were talking about. You know, there's recent data in the last several years that says that when high school kids get financial education, they have higher credit scores, they have lower loan default rates, they get uh, their financing for their next step in education, whatever that may be, is um, more efficient for them. They get more scholarships, they get better loan loan rates. So when you talk about, you know, the people's futures, just by having financial education in high school, the decision making at that first big point as they're starting to graduate from college, maybe they have their first job, is, is really critical because that's going to set them up. That sets them up for accumulating wealth for themselves, for their families. The rate of intergenerational wealth transfer in the Black community, there's great research on that, is, is, actually, is actually negative, right? So, so, you know, I was lucky I inherited a little bit of money from my parents that let me do some nice things for myself and my family. I I worked hard. I was, you know, I was just a lucky person because I was brought up with all these skill sets. So, um, so I do think that starting young makes a, makes a giant difference. And this idea of meeting people where they are and meeting the people that need it the most is really important to us. So we created access zones in the last several years. So we try to double down on resources and training for teachers in communities that are least likely to have access to financial education so we can start giving the people who really need the leg up the extra time, attention, energy, so that they'll have the tools to, um, so that we're really trying to level the playing field is what well, it's all about. What a concept, right? Invest where there's disparity, invest where there's need, right? I mean, if you have a famine, that's sort of where you send the food, right? And where you have uh, zones, uh, and, and that's what you're saying. You're saying there are identifiable zones of financial illiteracy, and you can invest in those zones to address the, those issues. That's that's repairing America, isn't it? I, I hope so. I hope so. Um, because you find that when adults, you know, we've got some very thoughtful funders that realize that when adults aren't able to take advantage of opportunities, when people are leaving 401k match money on the table, that's free money. Um, that you have to kind of work backwards from that. We teach third graders about compound interest using jelly beans, okay? It's a great incentive. I think they're not allowed to use jelly beans in some of the schools anymore because the sugar thing. But like, honestly, like that sort of stuff worked for me when I was a little kid and it still works because kids are still going to want to eat that stuff. So yeah. um, so then you get to, you know, you get to your first game plan, uh, your first job. And if you're lucky enough to have, you know, some 401k money coming toward you, it's like, Hmm, I'm getting free money and it's going to grow a lot. That's a good thing. I, so, I'll make that effort. I'll make that one percent effort. So this is this is wonderful because each of you in 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 talking about this, one of the things that you're pointing out is is the results of one of our polls. We talked about barriers. What is the single biggest barrier to acquiring basic money management skills? And we said, you know, lack of math. That wasn't it. Uh, we said embarrassment. That isn't it. No time. That's not it. You know what it is? It's mentorship. 
mentorship. Absolutely. It's, yep. It's, Absolutely. It's, it's, and that's true for no matter what the age is, right? Yep. It, it's not even a classroom kind of top down, yep. somebody yep. giving a lecture. It's basically people talking to each other and helping each yep. other out, right? Yeah. And, and Mark, that, it's such a huge, huge point. And obviously you see the kind of, you know, informal validation here. That's what we discovered early on at Money Think um, way back in, uh, in 2008, where we had these near peer mentorship pods, which actually grew nationally across the country to 30 universities. The, the fact that somebody was there to listen, to learn, to actually pay attention, to focus on the person was such a huge lever. And we've really, we've leveraged that in, in our own trajectory because we saw the power of mentorship, the power of coaching and um, the ability to create that space where, again, the person feels seen and heard. And, and there's this uh, understanding of like, hey, I have options and I have choices. What, what are the best kind of choices for me, given my essential financial circumstances and in, in our case, academic goals? And so I who served as an enlisted got out, got out with 27 K and, and is mentoring others to, to help them make, make uh, good decisions. Right. It's, it's that kind of life experience that gets to be shared. Right. Skip? Look, America is a wealthy nation. Unequal access to wealth is causing huge issues in our country right now. But this isn't the whole answer, but it's at least part of it. And we need to come to grips with this, teaching young people good skills. I mean, they, yeah, you have to, there's a, there's a whole range of issues that are surrounding this. And one of them is it's a weight thing. But you do that 10% all the way through. I knew, I knew a guy, in, enlisted people do not make a lot of money. He retired as an E9, which is at the top of the enlisted ranks with 30 years. But he's a millionaire because all he did was put 10% away all the way through. I mean, but... And you can do it later. It's not, this isn't an end all thing, but, but if you do it young and that's all these kids have to grasp that, that it's so important. And, you know, if you use your money, what money you have on, Hey, the Uber eats or whatever. I mean, I don't even, and I can afford it. I don't even get Uber eats uh, normally. I mean, maybe once in a great while because it, there's so much money laid on top of all that stuff and not, nothing against Uber. I love Uber, but um <laughs> But the point is, 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 you know, make, hey, hey, bring food into the house, you know, make it, there, there's a million ways you can deal with this versus some of the ways that I see young people just wasting through money. And then they say they don't have any. I mean, right now we do have rising inflation. It's, it's really hurting low income people. I mean, I'm not saying that's not a real thing because it is a very real thing. But um, we, uh, we at least have part of the answer right now. So you know, Mark, I, Mark I, I think that, sorry, just hugely important. Um, part of the disparity and, and Skip and Ann are talking to this as well is how do we actually teach adults to teach younger people around financial literacy and around financial decision-making? There's a huge chasm there. And I think that's part of what, what we're seeing. Adults don't know how. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, in our case, we, we've developed this college affordability tool called Decided, where we basically, we said, we, we unlocked it, we ungated it, it's free to the public. We also, in, in terms of students, we also noticed, hey, there are a bunch of college counselors, you know, student advisors who don't have the knowledge and know-how to actually guide students properly around financial decision-making, around affordability. And so what if we developed tools for them so they can actually do the job that they want to, meaning less administrative tasks and a more holistic engagement and just a, a clearer through line for those students. So I think that there's a huge chasm here that we all have an opportunity to address. It's not just teaching financial literacy and financial capability to young people, but actually empowering adults who can do that in a well in a way that, again, meets them where they're at. And we can do it, right? I mean, we can do it. There's nothing... There's nothing negative about about empowering people, empowering your neighbor, uh, empowering somebody who doesn't look like you. Right. I mean, this is going to make the country stronger. And now we're going to give you the last word. I just want to want to uh, point out that we, we asked this question on um, what is the biggest uh, single reason that people should be financially literate? Two, two answers got the biggest uh, response. One, money is power. Money is power. Knowing how to use money makes you more powerful. And the second answer was resilience. Resilience. We toughen up when we know how to manage money. Right? Now, take us out. We're, we've come to the end of our, 
of our of a wonderful discussion. What should we all be thinking about? How can we help to improve this situation through our small acts? Um, helping our kids learn, helping our colleagues learn, helping people who we don't even know and protecting them, doing the right thing uh, for, for each other and for the country. How should we be thinking about this? If you know somebody that needs help, uh, please help them. Or, or if you're somebody that needs help with your finances, ask for help. There are, for adults, there are lots of great organizations. There are national credit counseling agencies, which do a great job at all of this. If you're in the military, call Skip. If you're a college student, call Josh. And if you're a concerned citizen, take a look at our survey of the states. See if your state has a requirement. If it doesn't, call me. Uh, and if that's too hard, go knock on the door of your local school and say, ask the principal if uh, there's something that they can do to help get financial education into the school, get the teachers trained, get resources there. Everything that we do is, is free for schools, teachers, and students. Um, but uh, that would be my, my call to action for anybody that's listening to today that wants to help America's children or wants to help somebody they know or maybe needs a little help themselves. Well, we got a comment from uh, an attendee who said the following. Uh, she complimented uh, you or the person, uh, she complimented you and, and said that you did a wonderful job. She said, um, I'm a woman of color now in higher education, went from GED to doctorate degree to a combination of everything you all three are talking about uh, to get there. And um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to uh, engage uh, people like uh, our attendee yourselves who are sort of spreading this, this word, but also making a difference uh, in the United States, in Americans' lives. Nan Morrison, President CEO of the Council for Economic Education, Josh Lax, CEO of Money Think, and Skip Bowen, Chairman of the Board and CEO of First Command Educational Foundation. You are our heroes. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Please thank your staffs. Please thank your boards. Please thank your funders. Thank your communities. And thank your students, because your students are going to become the educators of their students, right? The mentors of their students. So thank you so much. And, and have a great day, everybody. Stay healthy. And uh, the, the, um, the uh, show on Thursday is going to be about people, how people treat animals, right? How we treat animals is so important in terms of how we treat each other. Skip, do you want to have the last word? Last word. This is like search and rescue. Who's not, who's not going to be for reaching down and helping a person who's drowning? This is the most, this will get the most bipartisan support ever if you work at all levels. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's get out of politics and get towards solutions. Everybody have a great day and we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks so much, Mark.